Good morning and welcome to the Sunday School lesson of the Abundant Love Church. I am Pastor Gary Bush, delighted that you all have taken this opportunity to tune in this morning. Thank you for the early risers, the early birds out of the bed, ready to hear a word from the Lord. We say here that Sunday School is the breakfast of champions. And they used to say in my day that it was the hotbed of the church. It is where you really um, grow. It is where you are influenced to learn the word and mature. And so we're happy that you have uh, this opportunity, happy that we have this opportunity uh, to, to uh, have you in our Sunday school lesson on this morning. I am joined here uh, by two members of Abundant Love. I have Minister Robert Bush. He just happens to be my brother. And I have Minister Gary Bush, who just happens to be my son. So it's going to be the Bush League this morning as we go into the Sunday School lesson. So go ahead and get your Sunday School book. If you don't have your Sunday School book, uh, the lesson today is found in the 118th Division of Psalm. That is Psalm 118. And the subject of our lesson today is the chief cornerstone. Psalm 118. Uh, we're going to use verses 14 through 29 for the lesson. And of course, uh, if you have questions uh, during this live stream, you can actually submit your questions. We will leave five or 10 minutes here at the end of the lesson to address any questions that you may have uh, on this particular lesson. Um, also want to, uh, while we're here, remind you that there is a morning service following this uh Sunday school lesson at 11 o'clock today. So you're also welcome to tune in. We also stream on Wednesday evenings at 630. And I'm supposed to make mention that every Monday morning at eight o'clock, there's a two minute video clip called Motivating Moments. And it's just a little snippet, a little video clip to encourage you as you walk with the Lord through the week. So this morning, um, happy to have our panelists this morning. Um, one of our panelists just ran in from work, and so if he nods, we'll nudge him. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm going to ask um, I'm going to ask Minister Gary Bush if he would pray for our Sunday school lesson this morning, and then we're going to uh, just kind of divide the reading up, and we'll go into our lesson this morning. Would you pray for us, sir? Uh, Father, we thank you right now, Lord. First and foremost, for just who you are, Lord. We thank you that you are all-powerful, all-knowing, that you make no mistakes. We thank you that you are perfect in all your ways and that you loved us enough to um, die on the cross for our sins, Lord. We thank you for the Sunday School lesson that we're getting ready to open up and digest and, and, and break down. We pray that you word our mouths. We pray that nothing that we say comes from our own thinking, but everything that we say is came from you that you were in our mouths and speak through us. We pray that we speak with understanding and comprehension that something that we say can go into the hearts and minds of your people so that they can use it and apply it in their everyday life. In Jesus name, amen. Amen. All right, we've got, um, it looks like we've got about 15 verses here. And so let's do it like this. Uh, Minister Robert, if you would read verses 14 through, I'm going to say 14 through 21. Uh, Minister Gary, if you would read 22 through 27. And I'll read the last two and we'll go into the lesson. Psalm 118th Division, verses 14 through 29. Psalms 118 and 14 reads, okay. The Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord hath chastened me so, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, 
I will go in to them and I will praise the Lord. The gate of the Lord into the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. Verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be that, blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which has showed us light, buying the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. The last two verses, verse number 28 and 29 says, Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. Verse 29, very popular verse. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. May the Lord bless his word this morning. Our lesson is the chief cornerstone. And so um, this is a very uh, popular psalm. It's actually filled with verses that we use quite uh, frequently, uh, songs that we sing that are derived from this particular verse. But this particular uh, or the division of song. This particular division is full of prophetic utterance. And so some of that uh, we'll get into today. But as we look at the subject, the chief cornerstone, I uh, want to get an overview from uh, the panelists here. Uh, what comes to mind, uh, Minister Bush, Lester Bush, Lester Bush, <laughs> Robert Bush. <laughs> Lester is my other brother that pastors at Duke Free Memorial. So uh, what do you think of when you think of the chief cornerstone? Chief cornerstone is basically the foundation. He's the primary rock that we build our hopes and trust on. He is what we look up to as far as being Christians. Amen. All right, what do you think of when you think of the chief cornerstone? When I think of the word chief, I think of the head. Yes, God is the head of the cornerstone. He's the head of what we, whatever that is built, the church, and we are the church. We carry his word, his spirit. He is the one that gives the instructions, gives the orders. He's the one that we follow. Amen. That's also what I think of when I think of chief. I think of uh, the top of the heap. Um, in the old cowboy western movies, all the engines had one little feather. But when you got to the chief, he had a whole headdress of, fe of feathers signifying that he was first, that he was top in the hierarchy. And so when you talk about a cornerstone, you talk about a building. It is part of the foundation of a building. And so what you are doing, uh, you are laying the foundation, but even the foundation has to be laid or lined up with a cornerstone. And so uh, this temple of people in the body of Christ that the Lord is building. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And our lesson today is divided into two portions. Uh, it talks about who is the Lord, and that's with verses 14 through 26. And then verses number 27 through 29 talks about what our Lord deserves. And so uh, this song opens uh, with a declaration from the psalmist, and I'll just kind of rehearse the first uh, three verses. It says, the Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. And what, what do you think uh, the psalmist is trying to communicate when he says that the Lord is my strength and my song and become my salvation? He's giving extreme high grace. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's giving extreme high praise to the Lord. He's saying that pretty much the Lord is his everything. Mm -hmm. um, his strength, his song, like when, when I think of strength, I think of um, what you do daily. Um, everything that he does, everything that we do is because of the Lord. Yeah. And 
when you're happy, sing songs of rejoicing. Mm -hmm. And so his song is about the Lord and his salvation has become his salvation. That just means the Lord saved him. So mm -hmm. he owes everything that he knows to the Lord. Amen. What about it, uh, Minister Bush? Uh, the strength and song is basically a, a high praise because they're considering everything that God has done for them. The ways that he's made out of no way, the doors he's opened, the doors he's closed. Everything that they are is because of what he does for them. And the salvation is the ultimate freedom. Believing on him and knowing that anything can be overcome with him on our side. Amen. Um, the Lord is my strength. When we think of strength, we think of an enablement. Strength enables you to do things. And so there are certain things that the Lord enables us to do. In fact, without him, there are certain things we just couldn't do. The Bible says in him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our being. And so he's an enabler for us. He's a strength to us. And I like what you said uh, about song because we sing about things that make us happy. Yeah. If there are any merry among you, let them sing the song. And so people who sing are expressing celebration, they're expressing happiness, they're expressing commemoration. And then he says, it's become my salvation. And when I think of salvation, I think of something that was designed to go to the trash heap that has been rescued and then brought back into usefulness. When you salvage something, mm -hmm. it's something that somebody has thrown away for no good, but you can take what has been thrown away for no good and then make it useful again. And so the Lord has done just that. Sin made us not useful to the kingdom of God. And so Jesus comes in his redemptive work and makes us, uh, can I say it like this, valuable to the kingdom of God again. Amen? Amen. Okay. So 15 says, the voice of rejoicing and salvation in the tabernacles of the righteous. Here it is, twice. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted and the right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. And so uh, we want to talk about what that expression means. What does it mean that the hand of the Lord is exalted and it does valiantly? Uh, the right hand of the Lord is usually a symbol of strength, mm -hmm. power, and unmeasured resource that it can't be measured. Because God is all powerful. Mm -hmm. And we're just great, gracious enough to have mm -hmm. that, to be able to rely on. Because mm -hmm. He is there for us. Mm -hmm. and, he, and He does valiantly. What do, you, what do you think of when you say that the hand of the Lord does valiantly? When I think of valiant, you, you think of someone that's always trying to help others to continue to bestow good tidings mm -hmm. and just be a good help to someone else. Amen. Amen. What do you think, son? The word, <coughs> the word valiant means extreme determination or encouragement. So everything that the Lord does is 100% no second thoughts. He does it because he feels strongly about what he does. So whatever the Lord does, he does, and it's already planned out. Mm -hmm. Amen. So so the right hand of the Lord now, uh, incidentally, my son is left-handed, but the statistics are that uh, about 88% of people are right-handed. So when you talk about the right hand, it's not necessarily... Um, an emphasis of the power of each one, but it's because it's the one that people use most. You shake with your right hand, you say, my right hand, man. And so the right hand is symbolized as a, a place of honor and a place of strength. And so when we talk about the Lord, uh, his right hand, the strength of his right hand and doing valiantly, uh, we talk about the strength in victory. When, when people are valiant in battle, uh, when they overcome or they defeat the enemy, 
Normally what they do is they grab the right hand of the victor and raise his right hand. I, oh man, if Justin was around. Uh, Justin and Ronald Stevenson loved WWE wrestling. And after every match, when someone got pent, they would lift them up, they take the right arm of the victor and hold it up valiantly. And that's what it means. It's signifying that the Lord is victorious in every place. And so there's no battle that the Lord will fight that he doesn't defeat. Amen? Amen. Okay. Verse number 17 and 18. I love these verses. I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. 18 says, the Lord hath chastened me sore, but he has not given me over to death. And so what is the psalmist trying uh, to communicate to us? Because we have the salvation of the Lord and we believe in him, we won't die. Our spirits will not die, but our spirits will go to heaven because we're covered by his blood, which means we have work to do. And in our sin, you know, we have to be chastised for it. And when you're told that you're doing something wrong, it hurts. Mm -hmm. But it's not hurt to like put down and defeat you spiritually, but it uplifts you, it corrects you. Mm -hmm. So because we have the correction, we just go forth and do what the Lord tells us to do. Amen, amen. What about it, Mr. Robert? I shall not die, but live is a declaration that he has guaranteed us as believers eternal life mm -hmm. after the rapture and the chastening is a consequence for when we sin mm -hmm. we have to pay the consequence but it's not to kill us it's to correct us to strengthen us and to make us strong amen amen um, I shall not die, but live is a, absolutely what you said. It's a declaration uh, that the Lord will not utterly put us away. Uh, he'll let us live. He'll redeem our lives. And then it says we shall declare the works of the Lord. After resurrecting our lives and giving us life, he gives us purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay, We are to let our light shine before men so that they see our good works, but glorify the Father in heaven. Our purpose is to glorify God. And then uh, another verse of scripture says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So every father chastens the child, not to hurt them, not to kill them, but to correct their behavior. Because when you correct their behavior, uh, their behavior uh, is, is pleasing to the parent that's training them. And so I'm waving right now uh, at my at my grandsons, they hear they're just sitting there like little men, well trained as they look at the Sunday school lesson. And so training, that's what training does. Training allows us uh, to be in a place that's pleasing to God and where we can give God glory. So uh, if you don't chasten your child, the Bible says you don't love them. And so the proof that God loves us is that he doesn't let us stay wrong. Right. <laughs> he doesn't look. Uh, my mother probably just about turned the church over one day uh, when she got up and she said, that's my son. She said, I'm with him when he's right. She said, and I'm with him when he's wrong to get him right. So uh, that's what the Lord is. The Lord is with us all the time. Even when we've done wrong, he's with us to get us right. And that's what the chastening of the Lord should do for us. Okay. Uh, verse number 19, 20, and 21, uh, he says, open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. The gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, 21 says, I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. Okay, what do you think of when you uh, look at those particular three verses? The gates of the righteous is the pathway through which we get to our salvation. Jesus Christ is the gate, and we can only get to salvation through him. Amen. He is the gateway. Amen. All right, what about it, sir? When we were in our sin, in darkness, the, the Lord, the light of the Lord, 
appear to us and it shows us something that we don't have. And if we really want him in our hearts, then we chase after that light because we realize just how much in darkness we were. So these verses are saying that because I've been shown this righteousness, this, this gateway, I want it more and more and more. And because he is my salvation, and because he heard me, I'm going to praise him for it. He's given me salvation, which means he deserves praise. Because without him, I would still be in darkness. Amen. Amen. When I think of a gate, uh, I don't just think of a gate. I think of a fenced-in area. Um, normally, a gate does not exist by itself. Right. It's part of a fencing system. And a fence is a barrier between what's on the inside and what's on the outside. What the gate does is allow passage from one area to the next area. And so when we say open the gates of righteousness, righteousness belongs to God. Mm -hmm. And our righteousness is as filthy rags. We have no righteousness. And so the gate or Jesus Christ as the gate opening to us allows us to come from an unrighteous state mm -hmm. into a righteous state. And when you've been declared righteous, uh, you owe God thanks and you owe God praise. So the righteous enter the gate. That gate is Jesus Christ. And then we praise him and we praise him because he's become our salvation. Paul says in Acts 4 and 12, he says, neither is there salvation or rather, uh, I think Luke wrote Acts. He said, neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given unto heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And so uh, it is the gate, it's the opening, it is our entrance, it is our access into the presence and the power of God. Amen? Amen. Okay, verse number 22, 23, and 24 are three of the most commonly quoted verses in the Bible. Uh, if you've been in church any length of time, heard you have heard these three verses in some capacity. And so we'll read them right now. Verse number 22, 22 says, The stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. 23 says, This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And of course, verse number 24, This is the day. This is the day. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And so, uh, Mr. Gary, what do you think about uh, what is the emphasis of verses uh, 22, 23, and 24? It is saying that um, God, Jesus, the Lord has been refused by a lot of people and he ended up being the head cornerstone um, because accepting him is a choice Amen. and the people who choose him have a different outlook on each day which means that it is the day that the Lord has made which means we're not promised the day and so every day that the Lord gives us is a marvelous day because it's a day that we weren't expected to have. You know, we prepare for it, but we never know if we're gonna get it or not. So it is a great day and we have to rejoice because it's a day that wasn't promised to us. Amen, amen. All right, brother. What I get from this passage <clears throat> is that Jesus was sent here with a mission and he was highly rejected by his own people not just the Gentiles but the Jews also and after going through that his father in heaven exalted him yes raised him up and made him the most important stone in the building so everything started to center around him, which he is the center of our lives. And it's like he said, each day that we live, that we're allowed to live, to function in, 
is a blessing because we're not promised the day, the night, the hour, the minute, the second. No one knows when they're going to go. And it could be at any time. But we have Jesus on our side. Amen. Um, the stone which the builders refused has become the head of the corner. The commentary talked about uh, how much fuss architect made and builders made over the cornerstone. Because if the cornerstone was imperfect, the whole building would be out of line. So they were real fussy, real particular about the cornerstone. But once you got a good cornerstone and set it in place, everything else horizontally, vertically, uh, lined up by that particular stone. And Jesus, whom they rejected, became literally the head of everything. I wanna uh, ask a question here while we're at it. Um, what do you think was the driving force behind Jesus's rejection? Jesus did so many great things. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He opened blinded eyes. It seems like to me that we would welcome that kind of power and that kind of influence. So if he did so many great things, why then did they reject him? I would say jealousy because most of his rejection came from the rulers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the priests and the elders, and they didn't wield the type of power that he had to speak and it be done to lay hands and a person be healed to say, take up your bed and walk. And it's all done at the, at the word. They didn't wield that kind of power. And it was a lot of jealousy and animosity because of who he was. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, why, what do you think was at the heart of Jesus' rejection? At the heart of it, well, Jesus' teachings were different than the letter of the law. Um, Jesus brought in grace and mercy. And when the law would say, if you did something wrong, so you need to be stoned, Jesus brought in, well, everybody has done wrong. So if you haven't done wrong, then you can't stone. So what Jesus did was he made them question the doctrine that they were so fond on holding up because they were the ones who upheld it and knew it. And Jesus came with a different um, perspective, with a different authority, and they called him a blasphemer. Mm -hmm. They called him all kinds of names because he walked in the, the, in the, in the authority of God the Father. And he said, if you've seen God the Father, you've seen me. Yeah. So they were not only jealous, like Mr. Bush said, but they were angry because they weren't the ones to uphold the Mosaic law. Jesus brought in grace and mercy. Amen. Um, it, it wasn't the common people who rejected him. The common people were persuaded to reject him. Yeah. It was religion. Yeah. Uh, that was a religious community, a religious society. Everything in their society hovered around God and around uh, the temple. The scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees were the aristocracy of that day. Mm -hmm. They were the richest, they were the most educated, they were the most revered, and they were, if I can say it like this, the movers and the shakers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Jesus came and upset the apple cart. He not only said things to encourage common people, but he said things to disdain that class of people. Um, Jesus, I heard a preacher say, and it's true, uh, Jesus was only hard on one class of people. People got caught in adultery, he gave them another chance. People got caught in sin, uh, he extended grace to them. But it was religious, dogmatic, do it my way or the highway people mm -hmm. that Jesus was tough on. He called them 
generation of vipers. He called them whited sepulchers. You, you know, in other words, he said the kind of things to let them know that it's not only that you won't go into the kingdom, but you prohibit other people from going into the kingdom. So Jesus is rejected because he upset the status quo. He brought in a new order that leveled the playing field and they didn't like that. And you know, it's not much different today. If you upset the wrong group of people, they will come after you. I don't wanna call any names, but there are some people who have done some things who are public figures and they got no reprimand. They just got a little slap on hand and then other people, they threw the book at them. I might get in trouble when I say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, this scandal in Major League Baseball, they gave them slaps on the wrist. Mm -hmm. And uh, other, other sports who did similar things, uh, it wasn't the same way. And so if you upset the wrong group of people, they'll come after you. Yes, Jesus, as long as he was healing, as long as he was saving, as long as he was redeeming people, he was fine. But when they start saying, blessed is he that come in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, when they elevated him up above the position of the leading class, then they said, no, we got to do something about this man. We got to take him out. And so um, it is that stone that was rejected. But the same one who they rejected, Jesus now is the head of the corner. What do you think it means when it says he's the head of the corner now? It means that he is, he's the head. Even though they reject it, they can't, um, they can't refuse or deny the power that he has because everything that Jesus said came true. And they were so blinded by anger in the ways that they used to um, operate before Jesus came that, and that goes for today. Um, and then that goes for the future. Um, Jesus is the only way. And because he did what he did, he saved, he healed, he delivered, but not only that, he died, he was buried, and he rose with all power. So when somebody has the authority, you don't have to display it. It's shown. And it's, 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 it's shown by example. So when you know that, it's either you get with it or you get up, you get away. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what, what do you think it means with it? He's the head of the corner now. He's been placed in a position where everything will line up with him. Anything that is not going according to his plan is out of order. And to be a cornerstone, everything has to line up. It has to have an order and it has to have a specific setting in order to work, to go outside God's will. It's not gonna work. I don't care how you try to make it, to force it or whatever, it's not gonna work. It has to line up with his will and with his way. Amen. Uh, he's the head of the corner now. What the religious leaders were supposed to be building was a congregation and a family of God whereby you got access to God. Jesus as the gate allows people that they didn't think should have been accepted. Right. And so that's the reason they rejected him. But the very thing that they were trying to build, Jesus now is the benchmark for it. Mm -hmm. yes, he, he says in 14 and 6 in St. John, he says, I am the way, truth and life. I'm the truth, I'm the life. And then it says, no man gets yes. access or comes to the Father except by me. In other words, yeah. without Jesus, you can't even get to him. He, he says some tough things to the scribes and Pharisees mm -hmm. and Sadducees. He said, he said, verily I say to you, he said, publicans and harlots are going to go in the kingdom before you because they received me and you all rejected me. And uh, was that Midas that said, you can pay me now or pay me later. Pay me later. You can either bow and accept Jesus now. And if you don't, there will certainly come a day 
The Bible says every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Uh, when he comes, the scripture even says, every eye shall see him, even those that pierced him. Mm. And so um, it is, it is uh, a demonstration of his position. He is preeminent. He's above everything. And so since he's above everything, uh, that very thing uh, that nobody thought was any good has become the best thing to everybody. Yes. And then the psalmist says in verse number 23, this is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Who else but God could have thought up something like this? Mm -hmm. I mean, God gives us the perfect plan, the perfect plot, perfect story, perfect hero, perfect ending so that we can live eternally with him. And then verse number 24 says, this is the day. This is the day. <laughs> Every time I say that, I think about that song. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And it's actually calling into mind not just a day, but the day that Jesus was made the head of the corner. Everything in history changed when Jesus came out of the grave. Mm -hmm. If Jesus had not come out, well, let me ask that question. Uh, what if Jesus had not risen from the dead? We would still be stuck because the work wasn't completed. You know, he said he would die, be buried, and resurrected. Mm -hmm. So, in my opinion, the death and the burial is an incomplete book. Mm -hmm. So, it, had he not resurrected he wouldn't have our power true amen what about it sir yeah it, it's like he said it would have been incomplete it well, nothing would have been fulfilled he had to come out of that grave and be resurrected to make everything complete and to fulfill the scriptures amen uh romans 6 23 says the wages of sin is death death what you get for sin is death and the only way to conquer sin is to conquer death. It, uh, Paul says, if the dead don't rise, he said, then our faith is vain. We're still in our sins. Right. But because Jesus rose from the grave, and I want to kind of pitch this here too, because there are people today who don't believe in life after death. They don't believe in life after this particular life. But Jesus Christ is proof positive that there is life after death. And because he rose from the grave, yes. we can rise from the grave. And we rise from the grave by the power and by the spirit that he gives us. Amen? Amen. So this is the day. Uh, it's a day to rejoice. It's a day to be happy. Uh, it's a day to be overjoyed. Uh, verse number 25 and 26 says, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Here it is. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And so now that the Lord has done his uh, work, his marvelous work, he's made this day that we can rejoice in. Now we make our petition to the Lord. And so what do you think of when you look at verses 25 and 26? What I see is a it's a stance that we have to make, that we have to take up. We've been granted this opportunity yeah. and a salvation, a freedom, and the ability to continue to strive toward being perfect following him. Mm -hmm. We just have to continue to stay on the path and continue to forsake all else. Amen. Amen. Uh, save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. I think of a few things. Um, like I take this verse literally in the order in which it was written. You know, we think of save now I think that 
whatever that I'm going through, save me from it and continue to save me. Save me daily. I need to kill my flesh daily. And then it says, I beseech thee after being saved to send prosperity. So I think about the verse in Matthew where it says, seek ye first the kingdom and then everything will be added. You don't want everything before you get saved, before you get the kingdom, mm -hmm. because it's just a bunch of stuff and that'll go away. So I think about save now, I beseech thee. That's the very first thing that I need. Save me completely, make me whole, because I want you. And then once I have you, then I want all the stuff because you'll lead me and guide me so that I know how to handle the stuff that I get. Amen. Amen. I, I like to look at this passage as uh, a continuation. Uh, the stone is rejected, and now the stone has become the head of the corner. It's God's doing. Mm -hmm. And because it's his doing, it's marvelous in our eyes. And now this day is a day that we rejoice in. And this day that we rejoice in because there's an opportunity now afforded to us that wasn't afforded before. Yeah. So now we beseech the Lord. We make our plea and our petition to him. Save us. Save us now. And bring the prosperity. Of, and when I think of prosperity, uh, in Psalm number one, it says, blessed is the man uh, that does all these things with the Lord. And so the Lord, the presence of the Lord is what brings prosperity to us. And we've been on the outside, not able to get to God. But now that we can get to God, prosperity is a reality for us. And we can now take advantage of this opportunity. Now, uh, now is, is the time, it's high time to really go after it and get it because the Lord has made it available to, him, uh, to us. And then 26 says, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And so uh, let's not just talk in terms of Jesus. What kind of blessing comes from people, from saints of God who know the Lord when they come into your presence and you have interaction with them? You can tell believers they have a different walk. They have a different demeanor. They even have an, an aura about them. And the way they talk, the way they carry themselves, it lets you know that they're following a higher power. They are dedicated to trying to live a righteous and perfect life. Amen. Amen. What about it, sir? Blessed be he or she that come in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. If you come to me in the name of the Lord, we have something in common. Amen. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you come to me the same way I'm coming to you, we have something in common. Therefore, you're welcome to come. Amen. Uh, when you come in the name of the Lord or you come representing the Lord, you bring all that the Lord represents. Um, I think of ambassadors. Uh, when they go to other countries, they don't just go by themselves, but they go representing the United States. And because they represent the United States, there are things that the United States have that backs that ambassador. Second um, Corinthians 5 tells us that we are ambassadors for Christ. And so when we go in the name of the Lord, we represent Christ. Uh, when people come into your midst, they have the ability to bless you, not just by what they say. Sometimes they're very present. Uh, the blessing of Abraham says, I'll bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curse you. When people come in the name of the Lord, they can pray a blessing in your home. They can pray a blessing over your family, over your finances. People, when people have, have uh, uh, contact with the Lord and when they have access to the Lord, they can pray and intercede in your behalf and good things will come to you. Uh, Jesus told uh, his disciples when they went out two by two. He said, whatever home you enter into, he said, let your peace abide upon it if that house is worthy. And if not, let your peace return to you. People who represent the Lord can bring a spirit of peace, an atmosphere of peace into a situation so that you can take uh, full advantage of it. Uh, whatsoever he doeth, she doeth, shall prosper. So it's a good thing uh, to be in the congregation of the saints and of people who represent the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right. We're coming down to the end here. 
We got three verses left here. We got verses 27, verses 28, verses 29. I also want to remind you, if you have questions, if you submit your questions uh, here in the next uh, five or six minutes or so, we'll take a look. And if you have any questions, we will address uh, the questions that you have. Verse number 27 said, God is the Lord, which hath showed us light, bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, and I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. 29 says, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Verse number, verse number 27 has some peculiar language in it. It talks about the Lord showed us light, but then it says, bind the sacrifice with cords, even until the horns of the altar. So uh, what do you think the emphasis is when they're saying uh, tie the sacrifice up? Um, when you sacrifice something and lay it on the altar, it's something that has a hold on you. And it's something that you're trying to fight with and you're dealing with, but you want to let go, but sometimes you can't. And so when you sacrifice it, it's a it's a stronghold. So you want to bind it up and lay it on the altar. And once you do that, you leave it there. And with the strength of the Lord, you can do that. Amen. What about it, sir? Uh, I agree with him. It is a stronghold. To bind the sacrifice, first of all, you have to be in a willing mood to lay it down. Because you can't be going through life and dragging something behind you that you're trying to get rid of. It's, it's, that's not a sacrifice unless you put it down and leave it alone. Once you put it on the altar, you're saying, Lord, I can't handle this. You take care of this for me and I'm going to leave it there. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of courage to, you know, make a sacrifice because mm -hmm. some things are still dear to us mm -hmm. and to put it down, it takes a lot. Mm -hmm. a, a sacrifice, uh, David said, I will bring something <clears throat> before the Lord that doesn't cost me anything. Right. When you sacrifice something, uh, I mean, it's not like what you give to the good one. It's not something that you don't use anymore, doesn't have any value to you. When you sacrifice when you sacrifice something, it's something that's valuable to you. It's something that still has uh, worth to you. And sometimes things are difficult to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. There's a battle when you sacrifice certain things. Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, most notably when you would uh, sacrifice certain things, you don't want it to get off, off the altar. You want to tie it on the altar so that God can get use of it. And uh, it's the reason that we fast in certain situations because we don't want the mind of the flesh yeah. to come between what we have given to God and what we have surrendered to God. In other words, once it belonged to him, we want to leave it with him. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that song say? Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them, leave them, there. Leave them there. And so anytime you sacrifice something, it's going to cost you something. And then you don't want to be what we call an Indian giver. <laughs> right. You, take you, it back. You want to give it and then, and then take it back. In fact, the Bible says it's better for you not to make a vow than to Indian. make one and to Indian Great. give that vow. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the Lord has shown us the light. We're going to tie that sacrifice with cords. We're going to put it on the altar. We're going to leave it on the altar so that God will not only honor our sacrifice, but that he will bless the sacrifice that we give. Worship to God includes a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And there are principles in the Old Testament that are still principles uh, in the New Testament. Uh, I'll be so glad when we can come into the sanctuary again and worship God because one of the requirements of worship is that you appear before the Lord. You present your, you come in the gate, you present yourself before the Lord. And then during that worship experience, you can't come in empty handed. There's something you've got to surrender. There's something you've got to give that's valuable to you in the presence of the Lord. And then once you give it, you have to leave it yeah. in his possession. And so uh, what we see, we see that the Lord 
uh, uh, absolutely wants our sacrifice. He'll honor our sacrifice. And then if we leave that sacrifice with the Lord, what we give to the Lord, he will multiply and give it back to us. Verse number 28 says, the declaration of the worshiper, thou art my God, I will praise thee, thou art my God, I will exalt thee. What, what is the heart of the worshiper saying in that particular place? He's giving God every bit of praise and honor and adoration that he can because he is God. He's due the highest of the highest of praise. Amen. And so he's saying that I will, like I have to, I must praise you. I have to exalt you because you are God. Amen. What about it, sir? It's saying that I accept God as my Lord and Savior. And I will give you the highest praise. I will lift you up above everything. Mm -hmm. I will exalt you. Amen. Uh, here, he made it personal. Mm -hmm. He didn't say our. He didn't say we. I said I. He said, <laughs> he said, thou art my God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he made it personal. He took it possessively. I will praise thee. I'm not going to depend on other people to praise you. You're my God. I'm going to praise you. I will exalt thee. And so uh, he made it personal, just like we have to do. Uh, even though we worship in a congregation and with a number of saints, it's got to be a personal experience. It has to be an individual experience. And even though we're part of a collective, there's a personal relationship that we have. And then verse number 29 says this. It says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. All right. What do you think about that? Brother Bush, uh, we, we owe him thanks. We owe him so much that we could never repay him. So giving thanks is just a small part of us giving back to him, which we could never repay. And he continues to do good things, great things, day in, day out. Mm -hmm. Anytime you wake up, you, you're, being, you're blessed. Mm -hmm. If you can get up and walk, talk, speak, eat, anything, Amen. you're blessed. Amen. What about it, sir? The Lord is good. And I'm glad his mercy endures forever. <laughs> <laughs> because forever is a long time. True. And it just goes to show that we don't deserve anything. Amen. And But his mercy endures forever. So that means... Whatever that we did, all we have to do is believe on him. And because Jesus is the gate and we allow Jesus in our hearts, we have access to something forever that we don't deserve. Amen. Uh, mercy affords us um, something. Mercy allows us to kind of get away with something that we deserve punishment for. Grace gives you what you don't deserve. Mercy keeps from you what you do deserve. We all deserve death. But the mercy of the Lord has spared us death with Jesus dying in our place. And that mercy carries the attribute of God. God is eternal. And the mercy of God is eternal. Throughout eternity, as we live forever with the Lord, we will experience the mercy of God. Because all the time, all the duration that we'll be in heaven, we really don't deserve to be there. But it's only because of Jesus Christ that we get the opportunity to live eternally with God. And so because of what he's done and the magnitude of what he's done, we should always have a thank you. Amen. Thank you should always be on our lips. Thank you should always be in our mouth. We should always have a praise for the marvelous things that the Lord has done. And I want to encourage you. Uh, Jesus is not just a stone in the building. He's the chief cornerstone. All of life, all of righteousness, all of salvation lines up by him. And so if you don't know the Lord today, this is a good day to come uh, to know the Lord. Uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, that Jesus has been raised from the dead, died sacrificially in your place. The Bible says, thou shalt 
be saved. And so the stone that the builders rejected, it's the chief cornerstone. It's really all about Jesus right now. And so your life here, your life in the world to come depends on your relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you, uh, make sure that relationship is good, strong, vibrant, so that you can get everything that God has designed and planned for you. I'm going to get uh, last remarks here. Sister Donna, do we have any comments, any questions? Okay, we have no comments and questions today. I'm going to get the last comments here from our panelists, and then we'll be finished with our Sunday school. Uh, what do you want to say to people about the chief cornerstone? The chief cornerstone, you just have to remember that Jesus Christ is that cornerstone. He's going to be the foundation of your life. You have to align your life and your lifestyle with his ways, and you will go far. Amen. What about it, sir? Chief cornerstone, which means he's the head, he gives the orders, and he's the center of everything. Everything revolves around Jesus. So we shouldn't do anything, say anything, go anywhere, talk nothing unless he tells us to. Amen. Uh, as the chief cornerstone, everything lines up by him. He is the example. He's not just the head of the church. He's the example of the church. And we should look at the example that he said. We should follow his example. And by following his example, we become God's representative in the earth. Amen? Amen. Well, I've enjoyed this lesson this morning. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Uh, as long as the coronavirus event um, uh, takes place, uh, then we'll be here on Sunday morning at 930. When this is over, we'll still be here at 930. And you're welcome, of course, anytime to join our Sunday school as we open the word of the Lord. One last thing I want to say to you today. Uh, this is the day to worship. Remember worship. Remember to support your house of worship. Make sure that you get prayers to that place encouragement to the people of your place and you want to make sure that you get your contribution your tithe and your offering to make sure that the house of God can continue to run. Of course Jesus is the chief cornerstone. I've enjoyed my time with you but Gary but Robert and we certainly bless you. Have a wonderful day. Our morning worship will start at 11 and we'll see you then.